All right, and welcome to the EMS section webinar tonight. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, we are uh, proud to have uh, a, a very experienced and distinguished uh, EMS physician presenting with us tonight, uh, Dr. Luke, uh, who is the program director for the uh, Disaster and Pre-Hospital Medicine uh, um, fellowship at uh, uh, Cleveland. Uh, Dr. Luke, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and if you want to go ahead and uh, take it away and uh, impart on us some knowledge about event medicine and, and mass uh, gatherings. Mm, sure. Thanks for um, having me. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So I'll play this works. And everyone can see that, right? <clears throat> okay, great. Um, we're good. Everyone can see that? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, great. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you for taking the time um, from what I'm sure is a busy evening for everybody um, to learn a bit, a little bit about mass gathering medicine. <clears throat> um, as Dr. Everett said, um, I'm Director of Pre-Hospital Disaster Medicine and Program Director for our EMS Fellowship at UH Cleveland Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, which is a uh, clinical affiliate hospital for Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. Um, and so, um, we're going to talk a little bit about mass gathering medicine um, and um, some of the um, opportunities um, that um, um, we can um, care for patients in this very unique type of setting. Um, a disclosure disclaimer that I am employed by University Hospitals Medical Group, which is our multi-specialty physician group. They provide financial compensation for my services to the Cleveland Brown Stadium and the Cleveland Browns. So the material presented here doesn't necessarily represent the opinion of University of Hospitals, Health System, the Cleveland Marathon, the Cleveland Browns, or any of their subsidiaries or affiliated organizations. Um, so moving on to the presentation, um, a little background. Um, we had the RNC here, you know, um, a little while ago in Cleveland, um, and that was only one type of mass gathering event. Um, there's different events such as sporting competitions, large concerts, um, religious gatherings, exhibitions, political events. And I think a common thread to all of this is that they have the potential to overwhelm event dedicated as well as local medical and public health care systems, resources, and personnel, just by nature of the number of um, spectators and participants um, and um, additional members of the population that come into your jurisdiction um, as a result of um, these mass gatherings. Um, Besides that influx of large numbers, um, there's also characteristics of the event that may impact morbidity and mortality, um, such as alcohol. Um, we are the official healthcare partner for the Cleveland Browns. And so um, we treat the spirited fans and they get very spirited um, before games. <laughs> um, and so um, we definitely um, have to be aware of that aspect of the event. Um, we also have to look at the existing host community, medical resources and personnel and what their capacity and capabilities are. Um, depending on where the event is located, um, some may have a lot of capabilities and ability to flex their capacity for the number of um, participants and spectators that are coming in. And some don't, and some they may need additional resources. And so because of these factors, um, many of these events do generate a high incidence of injury and illness. They're really um, um, higher than that, than that which is endemic to that host community which is hosting them. <clears throat> Um, so there is the potential, um, as we see in that picture in the right upper quadrant of the Boston Marathon, that um, extraordinary and catastrophic events can occur during these mass gatherings, um, whether it's natural, um, tornadoes, um, um, hurricanes, or they're human initiated, like terrorism. Um, and so part of our role is to practically address and the safety of the participants and the attendees of these events and really plan for the surge in demands for medical resources and personnel. And um, because of that, these factors do present unique challenges in health and medical care planning and delivery um, for uh, the planning stages, during the planning stages um, for these events. So a few definitions first, um, you know, what is a mass gathering and how do we define it? Um, so there are some definitions where you're saying that the um, spectators and participants at these events are at least 1,000 persons, and they're gathered voluntarily at a specific location for a defined period of time. Um, medical care coverage for greater than 25,000 attendees with an emphasis on spectator care conditions and planning. It's another definition that's been out there for mass gathering medical care. Um, 
But really the spectator and participant numbers alone cannot really solely predict what your adequate requirements are gonna be for the designated medical services um, for that particular um, event. These definitions really do not address the situations in which spectators are spread over multiple large venues, um, whether they're separated by long distances between sites, and if they don't really have access to event dedicated medical care, either between the sites or between days of the event, right? Um, such as maybe the Olympic Games, um, which could be spread out through multiple venues. A more appropriate definition when we think about mass gathering medical care is really that there's a potential for delayed response to emergencies because of limited access to patients or other features of that environment and location. And it really highlights the supply and demand mismatch that really presents the challenges to mass gathering medical care planning, whether it's via jurisdictional response or whether it's via dedicated event medical responses that that event has contracted for. There's a lot of heterogeneity uh, for the mass gatherings, um, the size, the nature and duration of the event, um, what their location is, the environment of it, um, what the behavior of the crowd is. Like I said, are there alcohol? Is there not alcohol? Are there illicit drugs? Are there not illicit drugs, right? Um, and really what is the demographic of the participants and the spectators? Are they typically younger? Are they typically on the older side with um, comorbid conditions? Are they typically healthy like a marathon or triathlon? Um, but then they have the, their own unique challenges as well, um, um, given the um, distances of those um, events and even the Ironman challenges, right? With, with uh, more extreme distances um, um, for the um, participants. So really our goals of medical care are um, um, threefold. One is to evaluate and stabilize um, injury and illness. Right, so um, anybody who is involved in that, participants, employees, support staff, spectators, um, and that care really needs to be consistent with the standard of medical care in that surrounding local community. You definitely don't want to go below it. You certainly can go above it, but you definitely want to don't go below that standard that's um, being offered in that local community. Um, you also want to preserve the capacity of that local public health system um, and acute medical care systems really to serve their local constituents, right? because you're still gonna have your strokes, you're still gonna have your stem, you're still gonna have your traumas vocally. And so this additional burden um, of um, medical need um, really should not impact that jurisdictional response. Um, and so you wanna do some pre-event hazard identification risk assessment to mitigate those risks, reduce morbidity, and really determine what that appropriate level of resources and expertise need to be dedicated to the event so that we don't rely on your jurisdictional response. And then we want to be able to optimally respond to extraordinary or catastrophic events. Um, we utilize the National Incident Management System or NIMS guidelines for the management of multi-casualty incidents. Um, <clears throat> those of you not familiar, right? There's this commander with an operations section, a planning section, a logistics section, finance admin section. And then we usually fall under um, one of the branches under the operations section chief. Um, usually it's the um, medical branch. And all these goals, right, these three goals really need to be addressed during the planning phase, um, collaboratively well before the event, okay? Um, it shouldn't be done um, at the event. It shouldn't be done just a day or two. It really needs to be done well before the event. Um, it's almost like you want to be able to recognize faces and shake hands and exchange business cards, right, before the event occurs. Um, and so you want to do it um, with your non-medical folks, um, like your event organizers, um, if there are other event medical directors, sometimes the medical response to these events are um, 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 separated a little bit. Um, um, and so you want to make sure there's kind of a unity of medical command there. And then as well as the local health and medical care authorities as well, um, if need be. Um, so the medical care itself, right, um, the types of level medical care can range. Um, some events may only need a basic EMT or a paramedic. Um, Others may need to upgrade to nurses, even physicians, and some may want to use the local um, EMS provider or maybe even a contracted EMS provider um, because the local one doesn't have the resources because they have to really respond to the regular um, medical needs of their jurisdiction and their, their constituents. Um, we have found that we've added a lot of trainers and physical therapists, which have been very useful, um, especially in our sporting events. Um, as well as podiatry um, for those foot issues um, that occur um, very well um, um, 
um, very happy to have them along. And then health profession students as well um, have certainly enjoyed this um, as their one of their um, initial clinical experiences um, and gets them out of the classroom. So we've used um, nursing students, paramedic students, med students, PA students um, to supplement our medical um, provider staff as well. There's a lot of predictive factors out there, um, weather, spectator attendance, um, venue size, um, the duration, like I mentioned before, is it one, is it multiple days, um, is it an outdoor venue um, in the heat potentially, or in a bitter cold, or is it an indoor venue when it's more climate controlled, um, but that affects ingress and egress. Um, are they seated or are they mobile? What type of event is it? Is it a concert, is it a sporting event, political, religious? Um, what is the behavior of the attendee? Are they using alcohol, recreational drugs? Um, how dense is the crowd? Are they spread out or are they all compact in a particular area? Um, what is the environment and topography of that event? Um, ingress and egress, maybe exposure hazards, um, the age of the spectators as well, and then the pre-event health of the attendees. Um, typically, the um, um, sporting events tend to have healthier participants. Um, but then if you get like a weekend 5K or something like that, you may get people who have are sedentary in their office job and they said, I'm just going to run a 5K for charity in a weekend. And they may um, um, have uh, risk factors um, for um, healing over um, or sustaining cardiac arrest more so than the elite athletes. Um, there's some um, research done on this in the past. Um, Arbin has like a three domains motto, which encompasses what I mentioned before and kind of three general domains. One is the psychosocial, so what are the individual behaviors and that social dynamic and culture. Um, the biomedical is the aggregate spectator age, the pre-event health status of the attendees, um, the physical activity levels of the participant spectators, um, the physiology of the response to extremes of the heat and cold, and what substance use um, might occur and the extent to which it's occurring at the event as well. In the environmental domain, it includes whether the event is bounded or unbounded, um, is it time focused versus extended? Are they seated versus mobile? Is there local weather? What is that going to be like? Crowd density, the type of event, and is it outdoor weather exposure versus an indoor climate controlled model? Um, and essentially, Arvin um, um, found in his research was that all of them play against one another, right? So the psychosocial affects the biomedical, vice versa, um, and then the all environmental affects the biomedical, environmental affects social. So they all interact with one another. Um, and that allows you to kind of look at the um, risk of injury and illness um, via the patient presentation rate and the transport hospital rate, which we'll get to in a minute. And then that kind of allows you to judge the response, like the level and extent of healthcare services. Um, so this model kind of interacts with one another. And so what the model does, it says, okay, let's try to find accurate estimates for the levels of event specific health and medical resources and personnel we need using this model, using these factors. So we can tailor our preparedness and response activities in order to mitigate our risks and effectively respond to illness and injuries there. Um, and what this does, um, as one of the overarching goals, right, is reducing dependence on jurisdictional health and medical care system infrastructure. Um, so we don't have to rely on what's going on in the local community. Um, and then what they do is they basically, there's an equation um, that they figured out, um, the math behind it is beyond my knowledge. Um, but what they say, okay, is, is that you take this and then um, you use this model in the following way as it's described here giving kind of a number to all these variables and then allows you basically to say, okay, this is the predicted number of presentations you're going to get based on um, um, these numbers and kind of some standard variables. So they kind of did a, did a, did a model there. A little easier model is this um, 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 scoring system that was developed um, where it just looked at weather, attendance, ethanol, crowd age, and crowd intention. Um, and then, so there's a little judgment there, and then it gives it a point value. Um, and as you can see here, um, if you basically were a minor event, if you had the total score less than three, um, your intermediate, if your total score was greater than three, but less than five, or you had a score of two in any one category, and then a major event was a total greater score of greater than five, or scores of two in two different categories. Um, and then there um, is a kind of a algorithm to say, okay, based on that, this is what your staffing needs to be um, versus major, intermediate, and minor. So a little bit about nomenclature and metrics when we get into this field. Um, I truly believe a minimum data set is needed. Um, 
So your demographics, injuries, medical illnesses, environmental illness or injury, um, mental health presentation, all comes to dispositions, like where did they go? Um, so the output measurements out there, um, it's been proposed that there's a medical utilization rate or also known as a patient presentation rate. Um, and it's demand for care by noting the number of persons present to on-site medical care per 1,000 or 10,000 attendees. Um, so both of those um, denominators have been used. Um, and that you'd use that ratio to apply for future similar events um, by multiplying it by the estimated capacity attendance that you'll get. Um, similarly, there's a transfer to hospital rate um, transport per 10,000 attendees from venues to EDs. Um, so when I calculate my PPR, I usually say per 10,000 because it standardizes it with transport to hospital rate. Um, and that's the impact on on-site care for event dedicated and jurisdictional EMS and hospital systems they may need um, for um, transport resources um, and to try to say how many animals I'm going to need for a particular event. The limitations to this, though, is um, it lacks documentation um, for people who seek medical care off site without accessing on site services, right, or following on site assessment. So they may leave the site, have an issue that's related to it, related to the event, but then they go to the local ED on their own, right? So they're not really um, counted in the numbers if you, if you do on site documentation. Um, so there's a real need to follow up with local EDs, especially if it's a big event, like a citywide event. Um, that serve that event area to really see what the true demand for medical care is. Um, um, so you can predict a little bit later on, um, not only for the event specific medical care, but also for the surrounding emergency departments that they need to upstaff a little bit. When you look at the literature, the, ver the patient presentation rate varies widely. It's anywhere from 1.4 to 900 per 10,000 attendees during different events. And most studies would have that narrow range about five to 32 per 10,000. Um, but that variation, right, is largely related to the heterogeneity of the factors, right? Because not every event is the same. Um, so if you're going to um, use it, you want to compare these PPRs and transport hospital rates um, to an event similar to the one that you're planning for. Um, there's a prediction modeling really right now using um, um, kind of a systematic uh, 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 review um, in mass gatherings where um, they look at um, a database search um, and they kind of say, okay, you're the records and they looked at the reviewers and they kind of went down and they said, okay, what are the most important factors contributing to PPR and transport to hospital rates? And so with a PPR, the darker the border of the factor, it means it's more prominent and more contributory to PPR. So the, on the biomedical side, level of competition was a little bit contributory, demographics a little bit less. But environmental weather and type of event was really contributory. Um, crowd size and accommodation was somewhat, and then free water availability in the time of the event was less so when it contributes to PPR. Um, with the transport to hospital rate, um, the type of injury on the biomedical side does help a little bit. Um, on the environmental side, it seems like weather conditions and type of event also was really prominent with number of patients and time of event and crowd size um, less so. Um, when it comes to impacting the transport to hospital rate. Um, so the types of medical care, most presenting complaints are minor, um, but even a small proportion of attendees would require high level of care, then really that corresponding response needed could overwhelm really an already crowded at right event emergency medical system. Um, so then that would subsequently impact your medical care delivery in the host community if you gotta get jurisdiction responses. Um, and then there's also the potential for extraordinary mass casualty events, right? We've seen it, um, the Vegas shooting at the concert, Boston Marathon. Um, and so really there's extraordinary for that, for terrorism, super weather occurrences, or food poisoning. So my role as a medical director for some of these events basically um, is planning, making sure it's safe as possible. Um, a lot of it's risk management. Um, so really, um, really prepare for it as high level as possible that the resource and personnel support allow. Um, part of it's financial, part of it is like, I would love to like staff it to the highest level possible, but sometimes um, either I don't have the financial resources to do so, right? So we have to um, budget that as well. Um, but the level is always going to be consistent with what's available, that standard of care in that surrounding community. Um, really needs early meticulous collaborative planning among all the stakeholders to ensure seamless delivery of the healthcare services. And then that cannot be overemphasized. It really needs to be done months in advance. Um, for the Cleveland Marathon in, that we have in May of every year, we start planning in January and February. And we've done it for several years now that pretty much everybody knows me, recognizes face, I recognize everybody. 
Um, same with our Cleveland Tri Rock and Roll Run, which is actually happening this Saturday. Um, and then the same goes with our operations team, the Brown Stadium, um, that it's a familiar face, right? And that um, there's a trust between both of us that we're going to do what's right. There's no egos involved, but this planning has to be done very early on. It can't just be the medical director shows up on the day of the event and expects, oh, I'm the medical director. No one's met them before. Um, that collaborative planning includes multiple um, stakeholders. So your event organizing sponsors, security service managers, security is very important as well. Um, your EMS managers and medical directors for any of the event and jurisdictional stuff. Um, public health officials is also um, important as well. And then any administrators really are responsible for surrounding area destination hospitals. Um, if we're closer to one hospital in our main campus university hospitals, and that's where all the patients are going, I'll reach out to their EMS medical director or the director of the ED saying, just to let you know, there's an event we're going to be transporting to your hospital, just making sure you're aware. We did that for one of our concerts on the east side of Northeast Ohio. Um, it didn't come to main campus, but went to one of our community sites, um, and we wanted to let them know. There's also medical care reconnaissance, so really you want an accurate perspective on what the medical hazards are going to be for that event, right? So you really want to have boots on the ground, maybe a couple months, a few weeks before this occurs. Um, the marathon, I do a ride course every year. Um, with our race director just to make sure that is anything changed, what's new, the construction, what's going to be a potential pitfall, right, from a medical perspective. Um, there's geographical boundaries of the event is also important to know. So how many professional responders might be needed, how you're going to distribute them, um, what are the response times you want within the venue, um, and then where is jurisdictional response going to be and it's a responsibility if an emergency occurs versus event medical, right? Um, and so... For the Brown Stadium, our event medical stuff is limited to whatever's on site on our footprint to the sidewalk. Um, and then anything outside beyond the sidewalk is this uh, responsibility of the local EMS, um, Freeman EMS. Um, vehicle ingress and egress is a very important, especially if it's an area that's landlocked or that there's um, barriers or traffic patterns um, that's got to be done by the local jurisdiction. Um, so you want to know how you're getting the ambulance out, how you're getting them back in. Um, Fourth quarter to Browns game, um, our Browns stadium is by the lake. It's very hard to kind of drive in and out of, so they change traffic patterns. But if that ambulance has to leave, we have a specific route for them to get back in because we may need them because it gets a little bit busy towards the fourth quarter. Um, and then what are our medical care space and rooms, right? Um, there's your ideal state and then your your real state. <laughs> um, the ideal state is I would like, you know, um, decent medical care station that maybe could double as a mini emergency department, right? A lot of these venues. A lot of times you get what you get, whether it's a big tent, whether it's a small tent, whether it's a small closet, whether it's a big room, right? Um, because sometimes um, there's limitations in terms of the um, physical space um, that's at this um, event. Um, potable water is important, right? Adequate toilet facilities from a public health perspective, the food preparation facilities and their appropriate ventilation, right? If it's a multi-day event, maybe it's outdoors, maybe it's hot weather, right? Food safety is important, right? People get hungry. Well, you don't want just the food to lay out for lunch and it's in the hot weather and then everyone starts getting sick, especially your medical staff, right? If it's that's the case. So you want to make sure that that's safe. And then what is your shelter from hazardous weather, right? Um, whether it's tornadoes, whether it's heat, whether it's thunderstorms, lightning, right? Where the Where's your medical staff as well as the spectators and attendees and the participants of the event, where are they going to be in case the inclement weather occurs? Um, there needs to be also some kind of address system, um, visual as well as audio, um, to say, okay, this is uh, crucial information, warning, telling the spectators what to do, and having these instructions scripted um, to and how to access your fixed and mobile medical resources as well. Um, in addition, you want to assess for what the state of your MSAC preparedness is in the community. If you have a concert and there's a structure collapse like we have seen before, right, in the country, what's your tech rescue, urban sector rescue abilities in that area? If there's a threat, chemical or biological, um, what's your decon ability, um, response triage and transport surge capacity of the public jurisdictional EMS that routinely care because if it's an MCI, you're going to need them. And what are the hospital capabilities, right? Um, one of the concerts we staff is not near level three trauma center. It's not level one, it's a level three. Um, so how are you going to get to, um, if you need to get to a higher level care, um, special care services, burn centers, decon centers, blood bank, bed get, get capacities, um, you know, how often you want to um, report bed census. Um, these are all factors to think about when you're planning for these things. 
In addition, the expertise of um, and levels and types of personnel really need to match the nature of demands for medical care. Some events, we only have medics and nurses. Some events, we only have medics. Others require a physician, right? Um, so really is um, dependent on the event and the number of different level providers needed. Um, you may only need one physician. With other effects, you may need more, right? Um, what is the specialization of staffing, right? It really must match that of medical equipment and pharmaceuticals that are be dedicated to onsite care and then also match the need of the event. So for the marathon, we have a multidisciplinary team where we do emergency medicine, um, but primary care sports medicine, um, orthopedic surgery, um, physical uh, physical therapists, um, you know, uh, um, athletic trainers. Um, and so um, typically what we do is we do the ortho people in the beginning, because a lot of times if they're gonna happen, they're gonna trip and fall. And then we do the emergency medicine um, towards the end a little bit, just because that's more the cardiac arrest stuff that we're gonna deal with at the end of the marathon. Um, and making sure that they're qualified and appropriately trained, right? That they can resuscitate um, an airway, circular life threats, right? Um, worst possible case scenario you wanna be prepared for. Um, and like I said, maintain that quality of care respect on the whole community until you can get to the next most appropriate higher level of care. Um, if you have an event that's predominantly PEDS, you want to make sure that all your people are trained to take care of kids um, and are um, policy certified or equivalent. There's also geographic placement and scheduling um, and where you're going to put them and then what time they're going to arrive. Um, what is the coverage area for these medical care? Communication is of the utmost important as well, um, making sure that there is some way to communicate with all the stations, whether it's by radio, we have a command truck that has a radio that amplifies the signals. So what we use, or cell phone, but sometimes the cell phone signals can get a little jammed in the area of the event as well. Um, and then the accreditation credentialing uniform of all the caregivers um, to say, okay, these are people that are assigned um, um, and these are pre-selected event volunteers or paid personnel that are gonna be working the event versus unsolicited volunteers um, who may pose a risk to themselves or others, right? Um, there are some events that just kind of say, okay, whoever wants to come can come, but they're not credentialed and they're not necessarily saying they have the right specialty to match for the event. Um, the documentation is important as well. Um, you want to say, what is a medical encounter? Um, so um, for us, um, anything above handing out a Band-Aid or an ice pack or a tampon um, really is documented in our electric patient care record. Um, and that does include over-the-counter meds. Um, and I found it the hard way that even if I write a protocol, the nursing board in Ohio, where I'm at, can't um, distribute Motrin or Tylenol without physician order. The medics can for protocol, but not the nurses. So the nurses do it, they have to actually get a, a, doc, a physician um, order to do it even at an event, even if I wrote a protocol. Um, and you wanna say, okay, what is the basic data fields you need, right, for that report? Um, and then what is that secure data path? Because it does fall under HIPAA. Um, and sometimes your event organizers may want to copy of it and you got to establish that relationship, like what's being allowed to give, what is not allowed to give um, because um, the HIPAA needs to be maintained. So you're going to get need to get sometimes lawyers involved with that to define it. Um, and then you may need to have a treat and release medical directive, right? So that might be specific um, event specific protocols that you could do paramedic based treat and release circumstances and what other circumstances be activated. So the paramedics function independently versus the need for medical command or physician evaluation present, uh, if, if present. Um, so maybe a rehydration unit protocol or something for um, a really, um, 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 a, for an event that has a lot of heat illness, for example. Um, we usually have a combination of fixed and mobile medical care. So the fixed medical care facilities usually are strategically positioned so they're easily accessed, um, especially for those spectators with physical disabilities. Um, and then you wanna have that arrangement with communication not only within your event, but also to local um, jurisdictional resources. Um, and then all official event really personnel has to be instructed of how to access those EMS resources through the venue dispatch center. And as we've seen here, um, this is a, a photo of the Vegas shooting, um, but um, basically there, there's a um, potential for MCIs right at these events. Um, they are um, a big opportunity for those who want to re wreak havoc. Um, you've also got the opportunity, um, if it's not on purpose, but for accidental stuff like stampedes and crush and fixation injuries. Um, and so music concerts, right? Devastated by the morbidity and mortality related recreational drug use and stage collapse. 
Um, so using your NIMS and your instant command system to manage these um, with your local uh, jurisdictional response as well, because that, um, that will be needed along with you as your event dedicated medical resource. Um, and then educating everyone on threat detection, right? See something, say something, um, having crowd density monitoring prevent those stampedes um, with their crush and fixation injuries, um, having food preparation monitoring, water testing if necessary, especially if it's a multi-day event that people are on site and camping, for example. Um, and um, spectators a lot of times become the responsibility of jurisdictional EMS and EDs during those multiple day events because off hours, if you're not providing the event medical, they're going to go to the local resources. And so thinking about foodborne gastroenteritis, sexually transmitted diseases, respiratory illness, and drug overdoses, pretty much from a public health response. Um, so in the remaining time, um, just a couple of case studies, kind of, you know, you educate others so um, people, others don't do what you do, right? <laughs> so um, these are kind of stuff that I learned over the past few years of doing this, and we have always continuous quality improvement with these. Um, so one is our Cleveland Brown Stadium. Um, a little background, we have approximately 70,000 Spectators employees per game, making it the second largest city next to Cleveland on game day in Cairo County, um, which is in Ohio, Northeast Ohio. Um, we have a total of seven medical aid stations in our stadium. Um, we have two attending emergency medicine physicians for the entire stadium. Um, and then each st station has one emergency department nurse, at least two paramedics, and then one emergency medicine resident if available. Um, as medical director, we oversee all the medical care and its operations. Um, the other attending EM physician assists with supervision of medical care. The Eden nurse provides care given in the medical aid station so they don't deploy, they're always there. Um, the paramedic responds to medical urgencies throughout the stadium, so they're the ones that deploy. And the EM resident provides medical assistance and real-time resources in medical aid stations, and they deploy with the paramedics if they're able to. Our goal is an eight minute ALS response time for any call, just like, you know, the jurisdiction, just like EMS agencies. We can obviously debate the validity of the eight minute ALS response times for those of you guys in the know, um, but that's what we use um, to make sure we get there in time. Um, the medical aid stations are designated um, across from the section where they are. So our main level and the service level in the basement is where our main medical, where the ambulances are co-located with. And then we have two on the first floor um, two on the third floor, and then two on the fifth floor. Um, our stadium layout is as follows. So we have elevator access that's a little bit um, um, sporadic. So our northwest elevators only go from our service level to level four. Our northeast goes from the service level to level five. Our southwest goes service level to level five, but there's a de designated press elevator only go to level four. So if you get in the right elevator, if you want to go to the fifth floor using that one, and our southeast elevators don't go to the basement. They only go from level one to five. And the reason for that is that when they constructed the stadium, um, they didn't fill in that southeast area on the basement, right? So that's why they don't go to the service level. Um, but our main, main first aid stations on that northeast side of the stadium, um, which is technically street level, um, in the back, in the north side of the stadium, just kind of the back of the stadium facing the light because um, it kind of goes down a hill a little bit. Um, and that's where our ambulance are stationed right there, right outside our main first aid station. Um, our level 100, basically, on the um, north side right here, you have two of them, 127 and 141. Um, and then the um, this is kind of the north side of the stadium, and there's stairs that lead up to here, where the south side of the stadium is actually street level as well, because like I said, it kind of slopes down a little bit. Um, and so, as you can see here, one of the challenges is that while you can go around the stadium, there is no medical assets on medical stations on the south side. So we have no um, fixed medical stations down there, um, and that's just the layout we're, we're dealt with. Our level 200s are suite level, um, and so um, they have um, no medical stations there, um, but you can get around, meaning you can walk around the entire um, 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 level there. Um, 300 is a little better as well. You can walk around and we have one on the north side around 342 and one on the south side at 316. Um, so we're a little bit better well deployed on the 300 as well. And this is our club level. It's a little less routed than the 100 or the 500s. Um, um, so it's a little more expensive, um, but this is kind of where we are right there. Um, and then the 400 is a suite level. But what happens is that you cannot um, go from north to south, uh, meaning that if you are on the south side, and to get to the north, you have to basically go down to the third floor and then back up to the fourth floor right there. Or, uh, yeah. And then um, we have a, 
a level called 317A here, um, where basically um, in order to access it, um, you can kind of go um, down the ramp of the 500 level to the fourth level and get there. And then with 500 level, we do have a, um, of a um, 533, which is the north side, and a 508, which is the south side. Um, but you can't get um, from the north to the south in the same level. But like I said, you have to go down a third and then cross over um, to get to the other side. Um, they also have a couple of other ones, like 622, 623, and then 351 there um, on the side there, kind of the east and the west side. In order to get there, you have to go down the fourth level and then take an elevator up to those levels to can get there. Um, our equipment is, like I said, sometimes I like to say better stock than a um, um, an ER sometimes. Um, we pretty much have anything you can think of from an emergency perspective. Um, and we do have a Lucas on site, um, keep it in main medical or respond to kind of any cardiac arrest. Um, and um, we have um, anywhere from a pediatric batch to an ob delivery kit uh, um, because, you know, um, Football fans are dedicated, and so they'll come at any time so it could be prepared. Um, and then, you know, from a documentation perspective, um, I do an after action report every year. And so, kind of from 2019, you know, we take what are the number of spectators, what are the number of employees, total attendees, um, how many patients presented at each game, the PPR, the number of patients transported, and then their transport to hospital rate as well, um, and kind of create a summary for the, for the stadium ops time. And we use health EMS as our electronic patient care record here. So December 10th, 2017, you know, it's a great game, um, kind of towards the end, you know, where you're about to kind of um, 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 finish up. And then what we hear is um, a man down um, in the lower bowl on the south side on the level 100. So kind of the first few rows of 100 on the south side. Um, and so um, we're getting there, um, but it, and as you can see, the level 100s are, um, you know, on the north side. So this is 108 is where it, and that blue square is where it's located. So we have to actually get deploy one of our teams um, from that north side all the way um, to get to there. And it's down in kind of one of the first few rows there. Um, and this is what level 100 looks like. <laughs> um, it's crowded. I mean, it's crowded. It's kind of towards the end of the game. People are starting to leave. Um, so this is what halftime looks like, but this is what, towards the end of the game looks like. And you have to maneuver through this to get to that south side area. So this is kind of one of the challenges there. Um, and so it was a cardiac arrest. Um, and so what happened is that we got there and then there was an empty field. And so what we had, we had a golf cart basically come and meet us at one of the lower bowls. And we transported the patient across the field to the ambulance. Um, because it was much easier than getting through that crowd situation there. Um, but obviously there were some access issues. And so after that, well, working with the stadium, we decided to put stairs um, on both sides, both the north and the south side, and have a um, medical crew, of paramedics, uh, a, a pair of paramedics stationed both on the north field and the south field, so that if there's anything that lower ball, we could send them up into the crowd from the field instead of down from the concourse, um, because that would take um, a little bit more time. So um, this allowed us to have a quicker response times, which has benefited several patients since um, we've done that. So that's kind of one of the quality improvements we did for this. Um, our second case is something that occurred in the Cleveland Marathon, um, where it's a 26.2 mile course. Um, it used to be that the Saturday race um, had the shorter races, and then the um, 10K half full marathon is on Sunday. Um, nowadays, it's the 5K, 10K on Saturday and the half and full on Sunday. Um, but there's about 15 to 18,000 runners over the entire weekend. And our deployment model is a fixed medical asset every two miles and four stations typically hit the twice along the course, um, even more than that sometimes. Um, so we usually have a total of about 14 stations plus main medical, um, two bike teams with two paramedics each usually, and then about three to four gators with two paramedics each along this course. Um, and so this is kind of what the 2020 map looks like. It's changed since then due to various issues, construction and stuff. So we've had to change the course sometimes every year, but you get a sense of how wide a course this is. Um, and in 2019, um, we basically had a young female collapse literally like a quarter mile from the finish line. Um, so you could literally see it. So there's the finish line and that arrow is at kind of where they are at. 
Um, and so unfortunately, um, this um, young female who um, happened to be a soccer player didn't make it. Um, and then this is all public knowledge. I'm not releasing anything that's hip or anything like that. So it's just published in the news um, that the cause of sudden cardiac death was a physical exertion, um, an undiagnosed cardiomyopathy and inadvertent pseudofedrin use that day for like for a cold or something like that. Um, we subsequently had cardiac arrests at marathons and they have had, they have survived. Um, um, but um, this basically led me to say, okay, well, what is the incidence of cardiac arrests at marathons? And so if you're not familiar, there's a great New England Journal of Medicine article out there, which looked at um, outcomes and incidence of cardiac arrests associated with marathon and half marathon races in the US and it did 10 years from 2000 to 2010. Um, and they found close to 60, about um, among 11 million runners, the incidence rate was about 0.54 per 100,000 participants. So that's the denominator they use. The mean age was 42 plus or minus 13 years, and they had 51 dead and 42 were fatal. Um, the marathon versus was the incidence rates in the marathon was greater than the half, and the incidence amongst men was greater than women. And definitely cardiovascular disease accounted for the majority of cases. Um, but if you look here, they did it okay based on the quarter, right? Of the race, they found that 80% of the non-survivors collapsed in the final 25% of the race distance or shortly after finishing. So the tail end of the marathon gives you the highest risk of cardiac arrests. And those that were under 40 years old were seven times less likely to survive than those over 40, um, because those younger ones were more likely to be caused by hypertrophic heart myopathy, and the older ones more likely to be caused by ischemic heart disease. Um, so I found that interesting in terms of what they found. Um, so you can see here in terms of the survivors, right? Um, myocardial ischemia, non-ventricular, non ischemic ventricular tachycardia, and then 3% were unknown in the red. And the non-survivors were in the blue. Um, and it seems like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was, you know, definitely um, a majority of this stuff, right? So, um, so 20, that happened in 2019, 2020, we canceled the kill the marathon during COVID. But subsequent to the marathon since then, what we've done is we've increased the distance between medical assets to one mile in the last quarter of the race, especially that last four miles. So in a 26 mile race, roughly the last four miles, four to five miles, it's the kind of last quarter. So using continuous quality improvement, what we've done is said, okay, instead of every two miles, then let's do every one mile. And then having a mobile assets there as well with our gators to be able to respond to anything um, um, during that time. And so I had the fortune um, opportunity to be part of a panel um, um, where at the National Marathon Running Event Safety, Safety and Security Summit a few years ago and say, what is adequate marathon medical coverage? And um, there apparently is no standard, right? Um, there are races out there that basically, you know, set up a medical station at the finish line and maybe have one at the half point and that's it. There are others um, who have a different model in terms of recruiting volunteers, right? Where they uh, go to the local community, but they're not like say vetted or anything like that. Um, so really there's a debate in terms of for like kind of marathon, what is medical coverage and what does adequate medical coverage look like? Um, if you're doing this in your future, in your career, in your profession, uh, I had the opportunity to, to participate in kind of um, a checklist for um, NMSP. It's called the Mass Care of the Medical Care Planning, the Medical Sector Checklist. Um, um, it's available as a download now, not as print anymore, um, but it, you don't have to be a member to get it. It's just cheaper if you're a member, but um, it does provide some structure in terms of how you're planning for an event. This, if you were to become the medical director of an event, whether it's a local 5K, because we have a cardiac arrest in the shorter races, like 5K, 10Ks. Um, so just because it's a shorter distance doesn't mean you're any less likely to have one. Um, and sometimes it is get the local doctor to be that, right? To be the medical director. So prepare, prepare properly for it. Um, so here's some references. Um, and um, if you have any questions, this is my email address. Um, um, and feel free to shoot me an email um, if you guys have anything. So thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Hopefully everyone learned something and I didn't embarrass myself. So thanks. <laughs> no, Dr. Lou, that was fantastic, man. There was so much great information there. Um, and uh, we got, I'm sure we have lots of questions. Um, I'm going to start out by the one that came on the uh the chat uh, and was specifically like when you have uh, medical students or residents or uh, you know learners, how does the liability play out in that case? 
Yeah, so I'm probably in a new situation because any of the events we do, they contract with university hospitals, right? Um, so we're a health system. So um, I have the um, um, policy, I guess is the right word, is, is that they have to be affiliated with UH or Case Western in some way because we are academic affiliate of Case Western. So we take um, Case Western nursing students, Case Western med students, PA students, because they have schools for those um, if they want to volunteer. So that kind of is under the clinical affiliation agreement. Our residents are all UH residents. We all use, we only use UH employees in our staffing our events um, because they've contracted with UH. So that is how the liability works. Um, there are other events out there that solicit volunteers. Um, I know that, like you know, I, I did my residency in New Jersey, Northern New Jersey, and in the New York City Marathon recruits you know volunteers um, from multiple institutions. Um, so um, they have probably and their residents and med students as well. So they different they probably have it all worked out there. So, but um, because our events contract with our hospital, we just want to make make it um, easy and clear that, you know, they have to be with UH in some fashion or clinically affiliated with UH in some fashion. And that could include residents from other facilities that do a rotation at UH. That are, so that, that malpractice is kind of like, you know, seamless. Um, but, you know, I've had residents and, that have said, hey, can I rotate or can I help out? And it's like, well, I can only help out, you, have you help out if you're doing a rotation at UH. Um, um, because that's kind of um, how we've structured it. But there are events who've structured it differently. Interesting. Uh, yeah. and, and kind of on the same kind of area, you know, event organizers are often required to have certain medical care because of uh, insurance policies uh, and the such. And does that play any role into your decision-making factor of treatment on scene or uh, documentation uh uh, based off their insurance requirements and and coverage requirements uh, that they have uh, uh, set uh, due to their insurance policies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the insurance policies, in my experience, has never really come up from a medical planning perspective. I'm sure that other medical directors may um, have more experience or uh, more interaction with that aspect of it. Um, for us, um, when I think about medical ops, I'm saying what's the most, what's the optimal structure, right? Like I, I don't really consider the insurance aspect of it to it um, so much as what is going to be the most proper medical care and medical resource management that's going to be provided for that event. Um, but I think on some level, there's a reason why um, they need a certain level of care. It's probably because of those insurance issues, right? Um, and so I think a lot of times what happens is that they want a doctor because it probably minimizes their liability a little bit and stuff like that versus just paramedics or just nurses um, 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 who it may be perfectly, who are perfectly qualified and maybe adequate resource for that, but then they want that higher level of care to minimize their liability regarding because of their insurance carrier or something along those lines. Um, I would just be, I would just um, make sure that um, if, they are requesting a position that however it's structured, um, you wanna make sure your amount of practice is covered, right? So the thing is, is that, you know, the, um, that it's to be a volunteer medical director for an event um, can be risky, right? Um, because, you know, if something happens, your regular job malpractice may not cover you for that um, event. You know, for us, everything comes through our hospital. So our hospital, we self-insure, so everything's over that. So, so if you're looking to be do a medical director for an event, just um, uh, make sure that you have some kind of medical malpractice coverage because the event may not have that, right? And do you usually, you know, another question came up in the uh, chat. Do you usually work with the um, the event planners? Like uh, if it's a concert, do you work with the, the concert planners? Uh, if it's the Cleveland Browns, are you working with the Cleveland Browns? Or is it more the venue uh, that that is kind of, dictating uh your contract and and how that negotiation kind of plays forward yeah our experience has really been with the venue um so pretty much anything that occurs on brown's Cleveland brown stadium um pretty much is what um we're contracted to do the larger contract in the relationship with university hospitals and the cleveland browns organization um and then you know we have a contract with the strike the rock and roll with the cleveland marathon um, um the overarching contract um, typically it's not through the performers or 
um, um, well, for us, for, for, with the athletic team, right? Because we we are all encompassing for that. But it's not typically with the performers themselves. Usually, the venue. Um, we 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 do that. We also like a lot of times provide event medicine coverage um, as a community benefit to smaller concerts and more like community oriented concerts in the area and community oriented events. Um, so that, so a lot of times it's it's you know we're doing this as a community benefit as well. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Um, one thing I was, you were talking, uh, you know, alcohol kind of played a role into it. Has there been any, um, uh, studies looking at how, uh, you know, one time one event that actually had alcohol at it, or then later on, they wouldn't have alcohol, how that affected their patients, uh, patient interaction rates and transport rates? Not that I know of, you know, I mean, you need like there's so many variables as I showed multifactorial, right? That in order to like maybe siphon off that alcohol slowly played a parts into it, right? That you would have to like make sure all the other variables were consistent, right? Almost like a, a case matching study a little bit, um, to say a case control study matching to say that hey, listen, you know, everything else being equal, alcohol versus no alcohol, right? Um, um, that may be a little hard to do, but I don't know of any studies that I just, I think everyone knows, like, you know, it's almost a common, like what we think about that alcohol would play a part, right? In <laughs> to more medical presentations. Um, but I don't think anyone's actually looked at that to say, um, because you would, as a sole, you know, contributor factor, right? Yeah, the one thing I think back about is I used to, we used to have this big oyster roast in South Carolina, you know, confined in this uh, old plantation. And as the event went on, the alcohol flowed and the uh, call volume and eventually we got to the stabbings and everything at the end of the event. Um, so it was, it was always very interesting to see how, how alcohol kind of Screw to that vinegar. Yeah, mix alcohol with uh, oyster knives and see how that. Oh works. my god! You can do the first <laughs> half and the second half of the event, right? You can see, like, <laughs> yeah. first, have you actually ever looked at like uh, changing your um, staffing based off how the event progresses? Um, is that ever? Have you seen any models that look at that? So I haven't seen any models that look in terms of how the event progresses. That would be an interesting thing to look at, right? To say, okay, if it's more <laughs> later on, you know, then you add staff later on. Um, I think you know. I think kind of like an old school thought process is that, you know, you just bring them on at the very beginning because part of it's access, like how do you get them in in the middle of the event, right? Um, you know, especially if there's uh, ingress, egress issues, right? Like how do you actually get them? Because a lot of these events, we arrive like a, few, a couple hours early before the event starts um, and then you're kind of locked in, right? And can't really leave or come in unless um, um, you really have that special permission or special circumstances to get to do that. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Ian just uh, mentioned that a uh, correlative uh, trend between volume of alcohol and incidents would be a, uh, interesting uh, to look at. Um, uh, it, what what emerging threats and the things we haven't thought about um, that you, that you've kind of seen um, uh, with these events? I mean, we've seen mass shooters, um, and, and and we've seen. Um, you know, vehicle or vehicle mm -hmm. use of uh, going through events and, and things like that. Um, is there anything you guys are concerned about, heard about, or or thinking about uh, when it comes that, that the other we haven't maybe thought about? Yeah, uh, I mean, I always think about right. You always think about that lone person who poses as a spectator, right, who are coming in, right. They, they buy a ticket, um, and then you know they may have a secondary device that hurts, you know, medical personnel at that time, right. Um, I always. You know, you have security, right? Um, you know, it's credential, it's lockdown, you know, threat assessment. Um, but you always you always worry, right? That, you know, whether um it's almost like we always say, like, they only need to be right once, you have to be right a hundred percent of the time, right? Um, and so what I always think about like what if you know what just a regular spectator that looks like a regular spectator, right? I mean, in the winter here it's cold, right? So they're wearing like big coats. I mean, we run them through medical detectors at the at the games and everything like that. Um, but, um, there, there's always the possibility, right? Yeah. I worry about like a coordinated event, uh, coordinated, uh, a shooter event where we have multiple shooters, um, interacting with us. So going from that one shooter, uh, to a, to a multiple personnel, I mean, the Las Vegas thing was incredible. The yeah. amount of stockpile he had, but if you multiplied that with multiple people, yeah. um, in a dynamic situation, I, that's one of one type of event I, I always think about, worry about 
happening. Uh, Dr. Ratchik, I saw your hand up uh, a moment ago. Yes, I was just going to say um, with your previous question about um, like different staffing, I help out with the Ironman World Championships. So of course, that has so many of its own challenges because it's a isolated small island with you know one medical center, et cetera. But um, now they've um, separated the men's and women's events. And so, of course, um, just due to the nature of um, the female participants, the um, stop times or, you know, finish times are projected to be later than the men's mm -hmm. race. So I'm curious, you know, to see um, how that goes in terms of medical personnel either arriving early and just staying late or getting in, like you said, through all the security and all that, you know, parking, even simple stuff that um, sometimes you don't think about, but getting there later and staying later throughout the evening. Um, you know, it's probably easier to finish later when it's a little cooler. Um, but then again, it's also nice to start earlier when it's cooler. So it's just, it's just interesting to think about those factors, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to the uh, multifactorial, the multiple domains, man, I learned so much today, uh, things to consider moving forward when we're planning our events, you know, here in San Antonio, we got Fiesta. Um, that's our fun one. That's a whole week long, uh, multiple venue event. And I'm, you know, we see it in the emergency department here. Um, and I'm sure all, all, uh, others in our community have had other events that they uh, deal with um, on a regular basis. So we hopefully can use this, um, this knowledge and interact with our agencies and our uh, local um, processes to improve. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, want to remind everybody our next uh, EMS uh, section meeting is on August 21st. Um, it is at uh, 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 five uh, central, but also we start at six. You know, we have a it, it runs throughout the entire area between five uh, east coast and three on the west coast. Um, so look out on your uh, my AEM uh, for the uh, invite. We encourage everybody to uh, to work. We've we're hitting a lot of our goals this year. Uh, moving moving forward with hitting uh, one having these wonderful uh, um, uh, talks about the future of EMS and and how to improve our care uh, uh, that Dr. Luke uh, provided us with tonight and uh, more to come. And then of course we are we've uh, been publishing in um, uh, Common Sense. Uh, and working on getting us uh, be act interactive on the upcoming uh, assembly uh, so we have more EMS uh, uh, process. So if you guys have any ideas or suggestions on future talks, things you want to know, uh, let us know and we'll get those out there. And we look forward to seeing you guys all on the 21st. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Luke. You, uh, man, I learned a lot tonight and I really appreciate your time. Anytime. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, right. everybody. All right, guys. Thank you.